morning, Res Church. My name is Emma, and I am in charge of communications here at Res. How are you guys doing this morning? Good. Well, it is my joy to see you here this morning, and I want to let you know that no matter where you've come from, no matter why you are here, and no matter what you have gone through this last week, you are welcome here at Res. Now, if you're anything like me, sometimes it's easy to get distracted in life. And what I mean is that I get all caught up in the little details and the little worries and the little things that come up throughout the week. And even in this exciting time we're in right now, I find myself getting distracted from what is really important and who is really in control. So today, I want us to take a moment and to think about who our God is and what He has done for us and what that means. Because our God is great. And that means that we don't have to be in control because He is in control. Our God is good. And that means that we can be fully satisfied in Him. And our God is glorious which means that we don't have to worry about what other people think of us and our God is gracious we don't have to prove anything to him he loves us and he gives his love freely so today would you stand with me and worship our awesome and amazing God King forever, 
Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Resurrection Church. I am so glad you are all here today. If you're new to Resurrection Church, I want to extend a special welcome to you. I am so glad that you are here. And can I ask a quick favor of you? If you are new, would you grab one of these in front of the pew in front of you? It says, I'm new here. And if you take a moment to fill this out or text the number on the screen, it's a way for us to help you get connected here at Resurrection. And I don't want you to leave today without being connected. And if you do that after the service, if you go outside into the lobby and you look for the next step booths, we have a gift for you. Just stop by. We'll give you a gift. And it's a way for us to welcome you and let you know how much we appreciate you being here. Don't miss getting out on Connected. I promise you're not going to regret it. And those, for those of you who do call Resurrection Home, I want to ask for you to continue to participate in the work that God's doing through the giving of your tithes and offering. A couple weeks ago, you may have picked up one of these cards in the lobby, and there's three options on this card. The first one is, I'm going to start tithing. And for many of you, you need to start doing that. And secondarily, it's, I'm going to increase my tithe. And there's also a third option on there, and that is, you're going to make a one-time gift. So if you haven't grabbed one of these, please do. We'd love to get you to Fill that in. And, uh, you know, here at Resurrection Church, we believe that God works through you, that he works through his people. And events like Resmania, anyone heard of Resmania? All right, that's right, right? Events like that could not take place without your support. So if you got one of those cards, please turn it in. Please help support the work that's going on. And here at Res, you can give in three ways. You can give online. Secondarily, you can text the number that's up on screen, or there's offering boxes as you leave the lobby. And so that's how you can participate. Now, back to Resmania, right? Resmania, I'm so excited about this. Are you guys excited too? You should... Right, you should absolutely be thrilled. And one of the reasons I am so thrilled, we have over 250 kids registered. Is that amazing? And we have you to thank, many of you in your small groups. Anyone recognize these? You've been handing them out. You've been leaving them on doors. And we have a couple left in the lobby. So I'd love for you to grab one of these because even though we're at 250 kids, we believe that God wants to bring even more kids to this event. So please pick one of these up. It's such a fantastic opportunity for you to invite your friends, your family, and people in your circles to come to Resmania. And we're so excited about Res, not just because of the race cars and go-karts. I'm excited about that. We're not just excited because of the foam cannons and the crafts. We are excited because kids will show up and they will hear the gospel. And that's the best news of all. So please, you have the opportunity to participate in that. And then lastly, if you're part of the Res family, July 14th, that's going to mark the end of Res Mania. And so when you walk in, services are going to be a little different. I just want to give you a heads up. We'll get you more information on what that looks like. But just know, July 14th, it's going to look a little bit different when you're here. And wow, we got so much going on at Res. God is at work among his people. He's among work with you. And so would you please join us as we pray for our service today? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the work that you're doing. We're so grateful that you are bringing the neighborhoods and our friends and our family to Resmania. Lord, I pray that you would use this event to reach the kids, Lord, because you say if we want to enter the kingdom of heaven, we should be like children. So bring those kids in, Lord. We pray that you'd open our hearts and our minds and prepare us to hear your word preached. Amen. And with that, I'd love for you to take a moment, stand up, greet someone. And if you want to have a little bit of fun, ask them how many people they're going to invite to Resmania.
those walls that we call sin and shame They were like prisons that we couldn't escape But he came and he died and he rose Those walls are rubble now Remember those giants we call death and grave They were like mountains that stood in our way But he came and he died and he rose Those giants are dead now And this is our God, this is who he is This is what he does, he saves us, he bore the cross, beat the grave, so let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear that took our breath away, Faint so weak that we could barely but he heard every word, every whisper Now those altars in the wilderness Tell the story of his faithfulness And never once did he fail And he never will This is our God, this is who we are
joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be And I can see the light in the darkness As the darkness bows to Him I can hear the roar in the heavens As the space between where's thin I can feel the ground shake beneath the Daniel, I'm one of the lead pastors here. Uh, as you can tell, Resmania is well on its way. Uh, they haven't let me get on the boats yet. But uh, Resmania already, so, so if you're, you're new here or you're kind of just hearing about this, uh, Resmania is our kids camp that we're putting on. It, it's about eight days away now, and, and uh, we're really excited about the potential of reaching into homes, households, families in this 10-minute window and around the community of Bakersfield with the hope of Christ. And so Resmania is our way of getting people to, that, that might not ever give us an opportunity to talk about the gospel here on campus, uh, get to love on their kids and, and show them an epic camp and do all kinds of fun stuff, teach them Bible stories. And then yeah, it's our hope of connecting with that family so that we have earned the right to share the gospel. And uh, we're really excited about that. What has been very exciting for me in, in this, this early portion, because we're not even at the camp yet and we've never done this before, is that I've gotten to watch the body of Christ, that's the church, come alive. So um, I don't, there's so many stories and we'll, we'll try to put some of those um, celebrations together, you know, in a few weeks after the camp. But like, um, dad and his dad have like lived here. Do you have sleeping bags and cots here yet? Because I, I think they've like, we're going to reserve parking spaces up in the front because their cars haven't moved. Uh, building these ships that will uh, probably never float. Um, and, and yet, we're still really excited about them because of the impact that they're going to potentially have. But I mean, there's, uh, I got to go out with Richard McBurney's group, who were all in their 70s and 80s, but they didn't want to get left out of putting door hangers out in, in the community. So we're out in Oildale with like people that can barely walk, but they're like, nope, we're getting there. <laughs> and I was like, dude, how encouraging is that? that no one wants to get left out of reaching the community for the gospel of Christ. So there's building teams and, and, and there's financial aid teams calling all these families. There's a prep for every single age group right now. There's production teams, drama teams, singing teams, dancing teams, worship teams, baking teams. My wife informed me yesterday we're building an eight-foot jellyfish. <laughs> Didn't even know about and uh, first time for everything apparently. Ellie the jelly, let's go. There, there's so many people in the church right now. There's over 228 volunteers signed up to serve these kids. And, and, and what I want you to understand is how biblical it is that everyone in the church, because the church is not a building, it's not an institution, it's a body, it's a family, it's y'all. And, and so when you open the Bible and look at the, the church is people that God's redeemed, put his Holy Spirit in, granted spiritual gifts to, and then put in community together to go out and share the gospel of Christ. And that's happening at Res Church. We haven't even gotten to Resmania, but, but uh, it, it's almost like FOMO right now, right? If you're not volunteering, you're in this little minority.
minority and you're kind of missing out on all of the excitement. And I think it's amazing. Um, we are moving on in our series. Guys, we're in a series called Identity Theft. Uh, we're in week two. So uh, we said last week, and I'll, I'll kind of remind you what Pastor Derek was here talking about. Um, we're doing a three-week series on 1 Peter chapter 2 and 3. In th- this couple chapters of the Bible, what Peter, the Apostle Peter is doing is he's addressing some identity issues, the difference between who you might have been before you met Christ and who the Bible calls you to be after he saves you. And everything is so dramatically different that we often get it distorted and twisted. And so last week, uh, our really good friend, Pastor Derek, came up from Pasadena. He braved, he left Pasadena to come to 108 degree heat, y'all. I mean, that's, that's sacrificing. And, uh, and he preached 1 Peter chapter 2, that first 12 verses of the chapter. And really, if you remember that big idea that we were talking about, it, it's that the identity that Christ grants us after he saves us is so unique, so different, that what we rally around is this unity, unity in, the, in the blood of Christ so that, that we should leave all other cultural identifiers become secondary and tertiary compared to our unity in Christ, which means, and this was his big, big point at the end of the sermon, if, if the Holy Spirit left the church, the church should crumble. We should be so different, so diverse, so, so incredibly weird that if the Holy Spirit left, we would almost have no reason to hang out together. In fact, if the Holy Spirit left and we still liked hanging out together, we might be a little bit too alike. And that was his point, right, is that the blood of Christ unites people that are so incredibly different and actually causes us to love one another and grow in unity that it's unlike anything in the world. And so today we're going to start uh, part two of that, the second in this series. All we're going to do is in 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to move down where he left off at verse 12. We're going to pick up in verse 13. We're going to do five verses today, again, on this idea of identity. We're covering Christian identity because you may or may not have heard there's an election coming. Nobody? No one's heard that? It's weird. I think you're lying to me. And we want to make sure you understand what the Bible says is supposed to be preeminent before a lot of noise from our culture tells you what should be preeminent. Do you understand what I mean? Whatever the Bible tells us is most important is most important. And so we're gonna start there. Uh, This is the big idea we're gonna cover today. I'm gonna repeat it over and over again. You can write it down in your notes right now. It's this. We, and we're talking about Christians now, people that are giving their life to Christ, we live radically submissive lives. I know we're gonna love that word. With supernatural confidence. We live radically submissive lives with supernatural confidence. So, let's pick it up in verse 13. 1 Peter, chapter 2. I should probably actually turn my Bible there if I want to read it. It's a good idea. I'm going I'm to read from the ESV today. Here it says, Be subject for the Lord's sake. Whose sake? Lord. The Lord's sake. Not for your own preference. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors. Now, I just, I'm going to stop right there. We've only covered like 15 words, but I want to remind you a couple things. When he says emperor and governors, so governors would have been uh, more local magistrates, right? So we, we have a president, but we also have Congress, we have a governor, we have a mayor. So we have different levels of government. So did they in the Roman Empire. And he just said that for the Lord's sake, We are to be subject to all of these human institutions. And you notice what he didn't say in here yet is like, you should first judge whether or not you agree with them and then decide if you want to submit to them. That's that's not actually in here at all. In fact, what he's saying is that God is glorified when we're submitting to human authority. Listen, y'all, as an American, can I be honest, you don't believe this. You, you don't. I don't. I, I mean, I, I think I should because it's in the Bible, but it's really hard to get my head around. Here's why. I'm rebellious by nature. You probably knew that about me already. Right? <laughs> Sorry about that. I, so are you. We're rebellious by nature. We're suspicious of authority by nature. We built a country on being rebellious and suspicious of authority. People are like, America was built on Christian values. No, it wasn't. It was built on being rebellious and suspicious of authority. Read the Constitution. We don't like government. We should, like, this is how America, so when you're like, I'm American, I'm like, well, we got some problems. 
or rebellious, suspicious people. So, look, you could be, listen, you could be American, and you could be uh, 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 proud of America. That's fine, right? You to- that, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But you also have to be honest about kind of how it started and what it's built on. And it's not built on being submissive. It's, mit- it's built on being rebellious and individualistic. So the Bible's saying God is glorified by our submission to human institutions, whether we agree with them or not, and he's going to tell us in this text, in five verses, that God is glorified in three different ways. And here's the first one. He's going to say, uh, God is glorified through submission to human in- institutions because authority, these human institutions, were divinely appointed by God. Man, you're going to wrestle with that in November, let me tell you. That, 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 that our government and our politicians were divinely ordained by God, that human authority was not an accident. But that's what the Bible's going to say in here in just a second. Secondly, that God is glorified by our submission because Christ accepted the Father's authority. So if you read anything about the Trinity, we believe that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are three distinct persons, and yet they're one God, and they're co-equal. And yet, the Bible tells us that even though that's true, Jesus submitted to the will of the Father voluntarily, and it's one of the reasons that we're called to submit to human institutions voluntarily. And then third, we glorify God when we submit to these uh, government and politicians and authorities because our actions commend Christ to others. And so your actions, believer, are either commending Christ to others or they're commending ourselves. And it's a clear call to commend to Christ. Now, in order to really uh, understand what's happening in this letter, I, I'll give you a little bit of background and context on how it was written and, and who did it. So it was written by a guy named Peter. The, we would call him Apostle Peter because he's one of the original disciples of Jesus. And just a little bit of background if you've never heard about Peter. He was a very uneducated blue-collar guy. He was a fisherman by trade. Jesus called him into ministry without a lot of formal education. Um, he was a loudmouth, so I can relate. He was brash and arrogant, and then when Jesus was going to go to the cross, he denied Christ, became a coward, and ran away. And then Jesus goes and finds him after the resurrection and calls him back into ministry and and, and commissions him and will take Peter and make him one of the boldest testimonies in all of the faith and end up building the, the early church on Peter as one of the original founders and elders of the Christian church. Now, He's writing this letter, and he's writing this letter about human institutions and about the emperor and about the governors in a moment in time in the Roman civilization when Emperor Nero is ruling. Now, Emperor Nero only ruled for five years, and yet he is one of the most famous figures in all of the Roman Empire here 2,000 years later, even though he ruled for five years because of how violent, because of his temper, and because of how he persecuted Christians. This was, arguably, the worst ruler in Christian history. And if you don't believe me, let me just account for a few things he did in his short five-year tenure. Uh, He was so anti-Christians that many Christians in the early church actually wrote letters and thought he was possibly the Antichrist. From mass execution of Christians to he lit a fire in Rome and then blamed it on the Christians. It burned down 10 of the 14 districts in Rome, killed hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. While it was burning, he went back to his temple and played on his harp and wrote and sang songs about burning the city down and laughed as everyone died and then blamed it on the Christians so that he could turn people against them. He took Christians and found unique ways to kill them. He had them eaten by dogs. He sewed them up in animal skins. He had them eaten by lions. He threw them in the Colosseum and had them killed by gladiators. He covered them in hot wax and then put them up on poles and lit them on fire and made torches out of them to light up his gardens at night. He is so infamous for ravaging people and towns by fire in just five years. Not only was he deposed by his own people because he was insane, but um, how many of you are old enough to know what burning a CD means? Couple? 
Listen, back in ancient history when there were dinosaurs, we had these things called CD-ROMs. And you could record stuff on them by burning them because it was a laser that did it. And the software company that built the software to burn stuff on CDs was called Nero. His five-year rule was so famous from 2,000 years ago. The software companies are calling themselves, like that's how famous five years, okay. So worst ruler ever. Peter's writing this letter about him, about his government when he says, be submissive. And, and, and the reason I'm trying to make sure you understand that context is that when you hear someone complaining about Biden or Trump or Newsom or Congress, if you've read history at all, you gotta chuckle a little bit. Bro, stop reading Twitter and read a history book. It was so much worse than right now. In fact, Paul, so Apostle Paul, another disciple that would come later, write most of the letters in the New Testament, wrote this in the book of Romans, uh, chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Again, same people he's writing about. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Rebel. Jesus, when he speaks, is being... Uh, the Pharisees, kind of religious elite of that time, hated that Jesus was there and shaking things up. And, and they're trying to trap him to say something evil about the government. And so they ask him about this tax that had been instituted. And in Matthew 22, verse 19, he says this, show me the coin for the tax. And so they show him, they, uh, they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is on this coin? And they said, it's Caesar's, who's the ruler. And he said, to them, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. When they heard it, they marveled and they left him and went away. So, so, so Peter and Paul and Jesus are all telling the same thing. Your job is not to rebel against the government. Your job is to submit to them. We just don't like to hear that because we're American. Well, I need you to see what, 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 if you take this biblical text and you apply it today, that means that God ordained Joe Biden to be president, whether you like it or not. You could be like, well, the election was stolen. Well, then God ordained that too. God ordained Gavin Newsom to be California's governor. Oh, but he's corrupt. Very probably. Doesn't matter. It doesn't say like, if you decide they're not corrupt, then submit to them. That's not the Bible. Our submission is not based on their goodness or their morals or their competency. And, and when, it, when, this, when this was written, it was way worse than right now. They're killing Christians off by the thousands. You know what else is not said in here? You know what Peter doesn't go? He goes, man, Nero's such a mess. You should just move to Africa. Just get out of here. Move to China. You've heard that recently, right? Oh, California's awful. You should just move to Tennessee, Kentucky, Texas. Nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible does it say, hey, if you don't like the government, you should move because it'll be easier on life for you. That is not a biblical call. That's laziness. That, that's us being wanting so much to live in comfort that we would literally change the trajectory of our lives, not because of the mission of God, but because we like comfort a lot. The idea that we should run away from bad rulers so that our life is easier is not found in the Bible. Let's keep going. We're in 1 Peter 2. It says this. So, emperor and governors, as sent by him, that's God, to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. So, your job and my job is to submit to the authorities that God has ordained. It's their job to govern in an orderly fashion. They may or may not do that. We're still supposed to submit to them. There are moments, the Bible will tell us, that we will have to disobey civil authority, civil disobedience. There are going to be moments for that. Now, what are those moments? What are those biblical exceptions to disobey the government? 
They're mentioned in Exodus 1.17. There's a story about this in Egypt. Daniel chapter 3, also Daniel chapter 6. They're referenced again in Hebrew 11. We're going to see one in Acts 4. And in every one of these things, we're going to see the same theme. I'm going to read you the story in Acts 4, verse 18. What we see is uh, Peter and John healed a, a lame man. They preached the gospel. People heard about Christ. They gave their life to Christ. There's all these salvations going on. Again, the religious elite don't like this. So they pull them before a a, a jury in a a tribunal, and they're threatening them. And finally, in verse 18, so they called them, and they charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. So when is civil disobedience for the Christian allowable, according to the Bible? When it directly contradicts God's commands. But like Pastor Derek taught last week, we're talking about when there are straight line issues. In Exodus, it's like, kill all of the firstborns. They're like, we're not going to do that. That's a, that's a straight line issue. Not jagged line issues where, where oh, I might be able to bend that into being anti-biblical and then, then I can be disobedient again. I can rebel. Uh, only when it directly contradicts God's commands. Listen, stop trying to bend arguments and call them the Bible. There, there was a famous pastor during uh, COVID, during the COVID shutdown, that, that wrote this letter and then sent it out like a press release uh, that basically tried to make the case that the American government had no authority to tell churches anything. Therefore, churches would submit to nothing from the government. That's, that's not biblical. That is not in the Bible. We call that creative reading. In school, did you ever take a creative writing class? Anybody? Anyone take creative writing? Okay. That's where you write fiction. Creative reading is where you make up what you're reading. You read the Bible and go, I bet that means, and then you make it up. It's fiction. Our call is not to make up what we read. Our call is to read God's word and then tune our life to it, adapt our life to his truths, not the other way around. Also, if you live in America, and that's probably all of you unless you had a really long trip here today, we don't live in real persecution. Like, you you know that what we experience here in America is not real persecution as a Christian. About, uh, of all Christians on the globe today, about two-thirds of of all Christians live in a country and a culture in which the government has made it illegal to worship God. So when, when we're talking about real legal persecution, you can be thrown in prison, you can be executed. I mean, actual serious penalties for worshiping the Lord. That's not us, guys. We have it relatively easy. Even though we like to complain, it is relatively easy here. And we should actually thank the Lord that it's this free. Verse 15, let's keep going. For this is the will of God. That by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Okay, I want you to hear what the Bible just said. The will of God, what God desires from you, because he left you here on earth. He saved you, but he hasn't taken you to heaven yet. So you know there's a promise to come, but we live in the in-between. We all all clear on that? Amen? Amen. All right, some of us. All right, good. The will of God is that we silence the critics, the skeptics, the the enemies of Christ by living silent, submissive lives under the authority of evil governments. That's that's what it says. We're going to do good, and that will silence the ignorance of foolish people. What I want you to hear, and you could write this down. Listen to me. Listen to me. If you're going to live in America, you got to hear this. A Christian's greatest testimony to the world about the power of God is not how loud we scream, it's how silently we suffer. Now, you don't like to hear that because we love to complain. We're awful chirpy for silent sufferers. A Christian's greatest testimony to the world about the power of God is not how loud we scream, it's how silently we suffer. Our voluntary submission to authorities, particularly evil authorities, says a lot more about our faith in God's power and sovereignty than our rebellion does. Why? Because as Christians, we live radically submissive lives with supernatural confidence. Now, maybe you're here today, 
um, and, and you're not a Christian or you're, you're kind of you're not sure about this whole Christianity thing, you're a skeptic, you're visiting, someone drug you here, you thought Resmania was today and it hasn't even started, I'm sorry, I apologize for the mix-up, uh, not nearly as fun as it's going to be. And you're thinking to yourself, like, I don't feel like Christians are usually radically submissive and suffering very silently. And, and listen, I'm just going to tell you today that if you think that, you're right. At least here in America, you're, you're right. Um, I, I'll just, I'll speak for all American Christians when I tell you that we are missing the mark. We are, we are being unfaithful to the Bible. We are caught up in feelings all the time and living disobediently in this area. I, I, I am. I'll just speak for myself. I am. And, I, and like over the past two weeks, sitting here trying to, trying to read this text and, 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 and look at my own life, I, I did a lot of repenting. And then I thought I'd, I'd done pretty well. And then the debate happened on Thursday night. And I got up on Friday and I had more repenting to do. Because <laughs> I read Twitter. And it was bad. In order to do this, in order to live this way, to submit and live confidently, we're going to need supernatural help. It's going to be radical. And, and, and the reason for that, I'll just give you some, some context. I think this will help. There are three primary ways that naturally every human reacts to living in a culture that we see where, where it's all going dark. It's all going wrong. We see that it's broken. We can all admit that the culture's broken. Raise your hand if you think culture's broken. Okay. No one's looking around going, really hopeful, you know? Signs everywhere that it's going to get good soon. Like, no, no one thinks that. We're, we're not, and the Bible is not telling you to pretend like everything is good when it's not. That is, it's not talking about fantasy land. It's not talking about escapism. And so, so when we see the distortion, when we see the darkness, when we see the injustice, Naturally, as humans, there's three way we, ways we respond to this. I want you to recognize those three ways because we're going to have to reject them all. Here's the first. I'll read all three of you. Here's the first. Aggressive anger. Anyone know someone like that or is someone like that? Let me just put both hands and a foot up. I am that guy. Okay, aggressive anger. Number two, slow, simmering, stewing. You just kind of sit on it all the time. And third, the passive pity party. You're welcome for the alliteration. I am Baptist. All right. Aggressive anger. Let's start with that one. That's that external, lose the temper, the blame game, uh, focus on the wrongs and the injustice, and it just drives me. Ah! It's your network news. That's why I keep telling you to turn it off. It's your shock jocks on the radio. It's, it's those podcasters that are nothing but criticism. It's the hot takes and social media stuff. It's protests that turn into rioting and violence. It's the, he's not my president. Oh, no, none of you. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, none of you. I'm a patriot. I'm a rebel. Everyone else is sheeple. It, it, it's wearing around that lack of submission like a, like a badge of honor. You, I just want you to understand. That, the badge of honor that, that you're, you're going to be a rebel, you're a patriot, you're a blah, 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 blah. Right? That badge of honor is only earned by dishonoring Christ. Do, do you understand? That's not a badge of honor. Like, like the badge of honor that says I'm a rebel and I, and I, and I don't listen to authority is actually just a scarlet letter on your forehead to Jesus. It's adultery to Christ. And I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, because I mean, this, this is most of my young life, particularly, and, and I mean, like, I struggle with this probably more than anything else. I grew up a constitutionalist. I think at one point I knew more about the Constitution than I knew about the Bible. But the, here's the thing, my hope wasn't in Christ, it was in American independence. Nobody? Okay. Listen, it's fine. You can judge me. We've all made mistakes in our past. I saw your bangs in the 80s. <laughs> Slow down, Gina. <laughs> B 
But we all know, if, if this isn't what you suffer, we all know somebody like this, right? They just, they're losing their mind all the time, and the external anger. But you know what's almost just as bad, it just doesn't sound as loud, is that slow simmering anger. And it's internalized anger. So it's the same losing of temper. It's just you're internalizing it, you're internalizing it, and it's an absence of joy and the presence of that anger. Just, you just stew on it, and it leads you to, to really weird behavior, right? Like at some point, something happens, and you have so much anger over the injustice, you just explode. There was, a, there was a lady in our church during COVID, uh, right after the government was like, you can reopen or whatever, and they were like, hey, the, the county health department was like, please distance if you come in the building. And so we, we taped off every other pew, and there's a lady that left our church over blue masking tape. Now, to her credit, there are actually a bunch of people that kind of lost their minds over blue masking tape. So I, mean, I, can't, I can't even just single her out. But she left the church over it. And I, and I didn't understand it at the time. I, was just, I couldn't understand. I was like, I don't, what's the problem? And she was just like, ah, rah, and I was like, is it the color? Like if we turned it, if we, if we use black masking tape? Because I couldn't, like, it didn't seem logical. It didn't seem rational. And it wasn't because she didn't actually leave over the masking tape. What'd she leave over? She had internalized oh, the anger of what the government was doing and the lies and the rah, 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 rah and blew up. And it was like the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back, right? And you're, you're leaving a church over masking tape, right? Now you're in a pastor's sermon illustration. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> totally sorry. And the third one's this, passive pity party. The giving up, the withdrawing. Kind of the woe is me, defeated. The world's too fallen. The world's too sinful. People are too messy. We just, we got to give up. And, and what that leads to actually is this, this bubble culture. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it doesn't lead to anything better than the other two do. But, but none of these three reactions, these are all normal human reactions to injustice. None of them are the Bible's recipe for living in a fallen world under the submission of human authorities, especially when they're bad human authorities. The Bible's instruction is actually that we have to have such confidence in God, listen to me, that you can live under an evil human authority and not get angry for God. Like God, do you know God is big enough to get angry on his own? Like you don't have to do it for him. Isn't that pretty amazing? In fact, he's pretty angry at sin. In fact, if we're being honest, he hates sin more than you do. And he has a plan for it. And there's justice coming. And so you don't have to be angry about it. Our, our first response to, 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 to what I'm talking about, to, to this fallen world, this, this the horrible culture and, 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 and evil government and terrible rulers and all these things, our first response has to be, first and foremost, that Christ is enough. Like, hear me, Christ is enough. To, to, to have Jesus, to have freedom from sin and the presence of the Holy Spirit is enough. In any country, under any government, under any circumstances, Christ is enough. In our Bible reading plan, uh, I was reading about the uh, guy who, who became a pastor in this foreign country where it was illegal to preach Christ and got thrown in jail for starting a house church. And he's in jail preaching the gospel. And he's just excited about the opportunity to get to preach the gospel in prison. Christ is enough. And, 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 and I want to show you that he's enough in, in, in here, in the text, in the scripture, that he's enough. And then secondly, secondly, you have extra help than just Jesus. We have one another. The, 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 we gather together in these corporate gatherings to encourage one another. We don't gather together so that we can complain to one another about how bad the government is. We're not actually supposed to do that if you've been working on that. We gather together to actually remind each other that Christ is enough. Amen. Hey, it was really rough. Christ is enough. Hey, did you see that debate? Oh, Lord, Christ is enough. There's hope because he's good. That's why every time someone tells me, like, I'm a Christian, but, you know, I don't do church. I'm like, what are you talking about? You're a Christian, but you, you're not in a community of Christians under the authority of elders and pastors that are, that are, that are discipling you and caring for you? No, I'm just, you know, I'm so, it's just me and G. I'm like, oh, I mean, listen, if that's true, I'm a major league baseball player. I just don't have a team. <laughs> just, you know, 
waiting for someone to pick me up one of these days. That is, it, that's not even the Bible, guys. There's, you'll, you'll see zero, zero examples of solo Rambo Christians in the Bible. You know why? Man, I am desperately in need of Christ, and I am desperately in need of other people to remind me that Christ is enough. Every, I can give you so many examples of me going off the rails and community bringing me back on because they're reminding me of what Jesus is doing. And I can give you dozens of examples of people that strayed from the community of Christ and are just a wreck. Their transformation, that the work that the Spirit is doing them just gets grinded to a halt on their own. Because, man, we're, 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 we have so many blind spots. That's why we need other people. Verse 16, let's keep going. Verse 16, here's what to do. Live... As people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Oh, man. Okay. The paradox of Christianity, just the, the, the craziness of Christianity, is that Jesus, if you were saved, that's because Jesus did something that you couldn't do. He came, he took you out of spiritual death made you spiritually alive and gave you freedom over the slavery and bondage of sin so you get to live a free life. And then with that freedom, we actually choose to be slaves to Christ, to live in submission, to take that freedom and actually follow Jesus with it. We're voluntary slaves for Christ. Now, I want to talk about, that's, the, that's sort of the, the theological way the Bible would describe it. I want to tell you practically what that looks like. So how then do you and I go about living a life that is honoring to God? Because God says if you'll live in submission under these authorities, if you'll suffer well and show them honor, that you'll honor God. So how do we go about doing that? How do we do that when the world is so fallen around us and there's so much injustice that we see? There are three ways. Two of them are really bad and one of them's good, so we're going to cover them. Here we go. You still with me? Yeah. Okay. If you've been dozing off, now's the time to lock in, okay? <laughs> Number one, the way to live. We could build a bubble. We could build a bubble. Now, the most famous example of this is the Amish. Anyone, anyone remember the Amish? They actually still exist. I don't know if you know that or not. Uh, they, they're, they're, I think they're in Pennsylvania somewhere. Years ago, decades ago, they withdrew from society. They reject everything modern, kind of live in their little bubble. They're going to they're gonna push off the outside world. And, 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 and listen, there's kind of a version of that even in Christianity today where we kind of decide, listen, everything in the world is bad, so we're just going to get, we're going to build a wall around our church, and we'll do programming every single night of the week, so there's always something we can do. We'll build our own schools, and we'll, we'll have our own clubs, and we'll have our own social stuff, and, and, and we'll, not to reach anybody, just for us. And then we'll have like our little holy huddle and just see if we can wait long enough for Jesus to come back. It's a, th it's a thing. I had a guy call me uh, last week and he, he's trying to build a, a Christian social media uh, network. An entire social media network is just, just for Christians. This is like the 12th time I've heard this idea. And he's like, we gotta get everybody off Facebook. And I was like, we do? And he's like, yeah, a bad company uh, corrupts good morals. He's quoting me Proverbs, right? And I was like, yeah, I don't actually want my congregation to get off Facebook. I just want them to act like Christians while they're on there. Is that, I guess it's pretty hard. Um, we're, there's nothing in the Bible that says withdraw from culture. Actually, the Bible says the opposite. We're going to run into culture. In fact, every example in the Bible and in the early church, the first three, four centuries of the church really uh, reaching new ground for Christ was running into rotten, toxic, terrible culture and being Christians. Running in and caring for people that, that had the plague and no one else would help them because they were dying and Christians would run in there and die well. When they would throw babies out because they had some sort of defect in the early, it was the church, it was Christians that would go adopt all those babies. The, the church has never been about withdrawing from a culture. It's always been about pressing into a culture and intimately being in that culture. Here's a second option, okay? We're not going to build a bubble. You know what we're going to do? We're going to scorch it with napalm. Yeah? Yeah, I love the smell of napalm in the morning. <laughs> Gonna go on the offensive. 
There's actually been a pretty big movement in the last 10 to 15 years, something called Christian nationalism. Man, if you Google this, you will go down the rabbit hole. Um, But it's this idea that we've got to get the country back to being a a Christian nation. And the way to do that is that we need like a Christian ruler, like a Christian prince. Like the Christian king hasn't been done before. But anyways, don't read your Bible. Uh, Or a czar or some sort of Christian ruler. And he's going to put only Christians in charge and leadership. And then we're going to turn all of the rules back into Bible rules. And we're going to run the whole nation like it was a... I mean, it it spirals into some weird stuff. It, It hasn't worked. In fact, what it's actually done is created really legalistic people that have a ton of criticism and no grace to compromise and live in this world at all. Um... But what you don't see in the Bible is that either. I mean, l- listen to what Peter's saying here. He's not saying, listen, go throw Nero out because he's clearly corrupt and let's put our own guy in. That's not what he's saying. No, he says, honor him. Submit to him. That, that shouldn't sound like rebellion to you because it's not. Let me just, let me ask you for some introspection for a moment. Just consider yourself for just a second. How many of you have had a snarky, uncharitable comment about one of the last two presidents or our governor ever? Okay, let me put it this way. Comment or thought. (laughs) Raise your hand. If you're not raising your hand... Have you either tuned me out or you're a really bad liar? (laughs) It's a struggle, is it not? Yes. 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 To be charitable to the people in... Do you know we're at an all-time low of uh, American approval rating of Congress? And we're setting records, guys. (laughs) But we're not charitable. And, and, And my justification for doing it is like, well, well, they're they're evil, they're terrible. They're horrible people, right? Except if we peek over to verse 17, Peter says, honor everyone. And then he specifically says, honor the emperor. And he's talking about Nero. In Peter's time, in that that first century, there was a a group of people in the first century uh, that were so concerned about the future of their nation that they were pretty certain, they convinced themselves that they had to take control of the situation with their own hands, that they couldn't wait on the Lord anymore. And, and they were very biblical people, and they were, uh, you know, outwardly, they were very, very holy and righteous, and they studied the Bible every single day, and they dressed up in the finest clothes, and they went to the temple to, to worship, and, and they were called Pharisees, okay? It was a religious group. And so they would dress up in these really fine clothes and they would go to the temple to worship God. And in, and, and in the midst of doing that, God sent Jesus to change everything and, and to fix the problem. And they were so focused on the nation that they entirely missed Jesus. But they didn't just miss Jesus because that would have been bad. No, they missed him. And then they accused him. And then they beat him. And then they killed him. And while they were worried about their nation, they were spitting on him while killing him. And Peter knows this when he writes. So so when you and I know what God wants us to do and we choose not to do it, we call that rebellion. It's it's dishonoring God. So so when we dress up in our nice clothes and say uncharitable things about a politician on the way to church, and then we stand in here with our arms raised and, and we start singing songs to God while openly defying his commands, we aren't honoring God. We're spitting on him with your arms up. Every snarky, mean response, every let's go Brandon or F Trump or mean-spirited, ungracious word about Newsom is more than just hard-heartedness. It's spitting on Christ. That's what the Pharisees did because they were so interested in having a nation that loved God that they missed God. In John 14, Jesus says this in verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And he reiterates in 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. You don't get to talk about loving Jesus and to disobey him. Like, to love Jesus is to want to do what he's telling us to do. 
In Matthew 12, he says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. How many of you and I can say that we've prayed more for Gavin Newsom than we've complained? That we've prayed more for Trump than we've complained. That we've prayed more for Biden or Kamala or that senator or that congressman than we've complained or thought poorly of. I can't. I'm not even tent. I mean, like, I've probably complained a hundred times more than I've prayed. And that's sinful. And, and so for the last two weeks, literally trying to read this and, and I'm just like, man, I have to repent again. I have to repent again. I have to repent again. So if it's not build a bubble and it's not scorch it with napalm, what is it? It's this third option. It's to be a light bulb. To be a light bulb so that we can wade into a dark culture and shine brightly. Matthew 5, 14 says this. This is Jesus speaking. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand, and he gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Luke eight sixteen. no one after lighting a lamp covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. We weren't called to hide and we weren't called to take over and burn everything down. We were called to live as lights in the middle of a dark, distorted world. And the light doesn't hide and it doesn't burn. Actually, to live as a light is to do two other things entirely. Light, it illuminates and it attracts. It illuminates and it attracts. When we live a life Honoring God, submitting to others, submitting to often unjust evil governments and leaders, yet still living lives of holiness, lives that do good work, that that love others, that are willing to submit to each other, that suffer well. When we do that, it's not us that shines, it's Christ in us that people begin to see. That's what it's saying here. When, When you do good works, it's God that gets the glory. Why? Well, I... I told you the three ways that humans react. So so when we live a life over and over and over again that doesn't react in those three ways, the outside world goes, man, they must know something different than I know. They, they, They must be sustained and filled up and satisfied by something that I don't know because how could they live so submissively in such a face of injustice recognizing all of the sin, recognizing all the evil and still live contented, satisfied lives? Well, let me tell you about my Jesus. So it illuminates it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't act like fantasy land and pretend that the evil's not there. It says, I know something greater than the evil, and guess what? I know the end, and it's already written, and I know the winner. So I can live in confidence. I can live in contentedness and satisfaction, even in countries where they're putting people in prison and executing them for loving Jesus. It illuminates. And that's why we can't hide from culture, how would we illuminate if we were hiding? No, the the Bible says we wade into that, and James 1 would say we we remain unstained by the world. It's that picture, if you've ever like um, tried to mix uh, vinegar with oil, you ever done that, right? You put the the balsamic, you put the olive oil, and it just separates on the plate. It's the sort of same sort of thing. But man, when you you really grasp hold of the fact that Christ is enough and you walk into that world, it's like water off a duck's back, right? You're in it, but you're not really in it. So it illuminates. Secondly, it attracts. When we live this way, nothing is more attractive. Do you know, so there was a study done um, a couple years ago. It said over 70% of American adults are searching for ancient truths. That sounds weird, right? Here's what they mean by that. There's always something new. And at this point in our culture, we're we're fatigued from the new thing. (laughs) And we're, we're kind of suspicious of the new thing. And so, so actually, most people in America are looking for ancient truths. Show me something that's not just true, but it's been true for a long time, and it's not changing, and, 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 I, and I, can, I, can, I can build my house on it. I can build my life on it. I can put confidence in it. Show me ancient truths that are applicable on Monday, 
that they actually have, uh, that would change the way I live. And what's more attractive than a sustaining power that brings peace and joy and contentment regardless of political situation, regardless of the economy, regardless of health or safety or who's in power? Like what's so powerful that you can remain contented at all times regardless of the environment? And I'm not talking about drugs. What's that powerful? That's Christ. That's Jesus. Verse 17, maybe the hardest verse of all. Ten words in verse 17. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, that's Christians, fear God, honor the emperor. Oh, honor Nero? Ten words. Four things he tells us to do. First, show respect to everyone. Give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Treat everyone like they're an image bearer of Christ because they are. Secondly, love the church. Don't just tolerate one another, love each other. Three, fear God. Real reverence, real awe. Your obedience to his commands is reverence. And four, honor the president. Yeah, honor him. Honor him. Now, let me tell you the trick to make this actually work and know it's not drugs. How do we live radically submissive lives with supernatural confidence? There's two things we do. Two things we do. We do this all the time. I want you to hear it. I want you to remember it. I'm going to tell you this every single week. Number one, we cling to Jesus so we can submit to each other. We cling to Jesus. The more you fall in love with Jesus, the more humility will feel natural. You gotta, you gotta cling to him. We don't stare at the sin and think the sin goes away. We stare at Jesus and everything else gets dim. You're stirring up your affection for him. You're figuring out how to pursue him more. We're praying that God would stir us up to love him more. We recognize the fact that I don't love him enough and I wish I loved him more than I do. We're putting people around us that will stir us up to good works, that will encourage us to chase him more. The reason community is so important is on our own, in isolation, we will slow down that pursuit of Jesus. But I don't want to do that. I want to be more urgent and more passionate. I want to stoke that little flame until it's a giant fire to be passionate about Jesus, and everything else will get dim. And number two, we have confident faith that justice will come. Can I ask you a question? Do you really believe that Jesus is coming again? Five of you. Do you really believe that Jesus is coming again? Okay. Well, then I want you to, if you believe that, if you truly believe that, and that's not just lip service, and you're not just saying that because I made you, uh, because it's Sunday morning and you're sitting in a pew. If you really believe that, then what's coming is in Revelation 19. And when Jesus comes in Revelation chapter 19, he's not riding on a donkey like he did when he entered Jerusalem. He's riding on a white horse, which is what the victors rode. He's not carrying palm branches like he did before he was crucified. He's carrying a sword. He's not accompanied by disciples who are uneducated. He has an army behind him, and he's coming to reign and to rule and to put every wrong right. And what I mean by that is there will be no injustice that was not met with justice when Jesus comes again. He's not coming as the lamb. He's coming as the lion of Judah. And he'll set everything right. There's a, um, how many of you have seen uh, Lord of the Rings, the, the, the trilogy that's like nine and a half hours long or 13 hours long, whatever it is? Yes, Okay. At the very end of the last movie, uh, this spoilers alert, listen, if you made it 40 years, I'll listen to this, uh, reading the book, or I'm uh, sorry, but the very end of the last book is called The Return of the King, and uh, there's an uh, insurmountable battle between the good and evil, but evil has like a force that's like 10 times the size, and so uh, good is never going to win, they just don't have enough people, and they're just getting thrashed, but then there's this guy, Lord Aragon, and he remembers that the, there's this army of the dead or whatever that owes his family allegiance, and so he goes through this whole thing, he runs off on this side quest, and he finds them, and they come in, and they're all ghosts, right? And they all come in and the right, just at the right moment and they wipe out the entire army. And there's a moment if you're watching that thing where you go, wait a second. <laughs> if they knew that the army of the dead couldn't be hurt and could vanquish everyone, why were they fighting in the first place? There's a lot of people, good people dying here, man. Like all these little hobbits and cute things, right? 
like, bro, why don't you take like a two day break? Let the army catch up, do all the work. You could have just watched it and taken pictures. And sometimes I wonder, like, do you really believe that Jesus is coming again and will set all things right? Because if so, man, you are really worked up for the fact that we already know the winner. How many casualties are we going to have in the church because we didn't step back and let God reign? Now, I'm not telling you to not vote. I'm not telling you to not want to do good. I'm not telling you to not want to address injustice. I'm not telling you that. I'm telling you, man, you have anxiety. I'm telling you, you, you believe, you believe that you trust God enough with your eternal soul, but not the election in November? I just logically, I want you to weigh that. No, he's good for eternity, but I don't know if he can handle this election. Guys, come on. Let's have some confidence in the sovereignty of God. Christ is enough. Christ is enough. What we're preaching, the idea that God is actually in control, that the, the, the problem around us was so great that he had to make a way even though we couldn't do it, that, that, that's just the gospel. We call that the gospel. It's the good news. Here's the good news. The good news is there is a problem and we all can see it. All you have to do is look at our culture to see it. And, and no amount of human ingenuity could fix the problem. And so if you've ever read the Old Testament in the Bible, it's basically thousands of years of humans really messing up badly to the point where if you're reading it, you just finally get frustrated with them. You guys, you guys are so stupid. And then you realize like, eh, that's kind of us. And the point of it is that no matter how we tried, we couldn't fix the problem. And so Jesus had to come to fix the problem. And he did. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And we don't just preach the gospel on Sunday for people who don't know Jesus. I, I preach the gospel to myself every single day. I have to be re-gospeled. I want to preach the gospel to you, mature Christian, every single time I see you. Because I don't think, I think if you're worried about this world, that you don't have a, a good enough understanding of the gospel. I think you need to continue to read gospel. Every time you, you look out at this world and you get worried, you get anxiety, and you get anger, I, want, I think you need to be re-gospeled again. I think you need to let Jesus take over those areas of your life that you're holding back from him. Because listen, Jesus says, my burden is light. To get your arms and your mind and your heart around the gospel is to live a life of contentment and satisfaction regardless of the circumstances. And so for the Christian, for the Christian, what that means for us usually is a lot of confession and repentance. Amen? Amen? Amen. Man, repentance, guys, is not that thing you did that one time when you came to Christ in 1982. It is, it is the everyday act of realizing that, man, there's more sinfulness in my life than I thought, and I need to give that area over to God, and man, then I can live and walk in freedom. And we do that through confession and repentance. Charles Spurgeon would say, when we deal seriously with our sin, God will deal gently with us. I need the gospel more. I need to understand it better. I need it to penetrate my heart more fully. So do you. And then for those of you that have never heard the gospel, you've never put your faith in Christ. Jesus invites you into a relationship. And I would just ask, do you, do you actually know him? Not of him, not stories about him. Do you know him? So just in the few moments we have remaining, would you do me a favor, will you bow your heads and close your eyes? I just want to ask you this. Because only you can answer this for yourself. This isn't about your, your relative or who brought you or what other people think about Jesus. This is about you. Jesus died on a cross to offer you a new life the actual chance to repent and, and turn from sin and for him to save you and to take away those burdens. Oh, but guys, the salvation that Jesus offers, we, we call it the gospel. The gospel isn't a transaction where Jesus paid off your sins so that now you're off the hook. It's Jesus dealing with the problem that kept you separated from him. So the gospel doesn't say you're free to go now. It actually says you're free to come now, to come to Christ, to come into his rest, to come into his embrace. 
If you have not put your full faith in Jesus and surrendered your life to him, I want to offer you the chance to do that today. Every day you wait is a day in which you do have anxiety about this world because where is the hope in this world? Jesus offers you his power and his peace. The Bible says everyone has sinned, but you can be saved if you will declare with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is your Lord. If you're willing to ask him for forgiveness and salvation, with every eye closed and every head bowed, I want you to just quietly or silently repeat this prayer after me. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. I know I'm incapable of living perfectly. I need you to save me. I surrender everything to you. In full confidence, I receive your promise of relationship, of the forgiveness of sin, of the Holy Spirit, and of eternal life. Be my Lord, please, Jesus. With no one looking up. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time ever right now, will you be brave and just raise your hand for me to see? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Put your hands down. In Jesus' name, amen. Look up here. Eye contact. Jesus loves you. He loves you so much more than you can imagine. He has a future for you that is so much better than you think. And if you said that prayer a moment ago, welcome to the family. The Bible tells us that all of heaven rejoices when a single person comes to Christ. There is a party in heaven for you right now. In just a minute, if you said that prayer, we're going to have some people at the back that would love to talk to you. There's a little banner that says, I raised my hand. They have a gift for you. They want to pray with you. But believer, Christian, who I've been talking to, who, like me, has been convicted about our attitude and our words in regards to our leaders, have been convicted about how little we trust in God and believe in the gospel and his control, uh, I want you to repent with me today. Look, I'm, I'm going to vote this November. Okay, I'm going to carefully uh, watch. I'm going to participate in this process, but I'm not going to lose a moment's sleep over the outcome because Jesus reigns and he institutes human authorities. And I'm going to invite all of you today as we sing this song to come to the altar with me today. And we're going to come up here. I don't think it's okay for us to be neutral or even subdued about our sin. So I want to invite you up here for all of us who have sinned against God, who have demeaned the authorities that he has put into place. We're going to come up here to repent and then we're going to pray fervently for our leaders and our government. We're going to pray for them, that God would save them. He would save their souls, transform their lives. So stand with us as we sing. I want you to come up here and we're going to pray over our president, our governor, and our government. Come on up. Thank you.
Father, we come to you first and foremost uh, with repentance on our lips to confess, God, that we have been hard-hearted, God, that we have lacked faith in your control and your sovereignty, that we've looked at the storm and the waves of this culture and we've had doubt and anxiety, uh, God, that we've had misplaced anger, and God, that we've disobeyed you in, in demeaning and demonizing the people that we see and the things that we don't like. And God, we ask for forgiveness and we ask for you to change our hearts, God. Help us to live in joy and satisfaction and contentment in the midst of a dark culture. God, help us to pray fervently for our leaders, the ones we like and the ones we don't. God, would you save Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Donald Trump, Gavin Newsom, our senators, our Congress people. God, would you save them? Would you change them? Would you save their eternal soul, God, and, and radically change their heart to such an extent that everyone wonders what happened? Would you build revival in our White House? And God, would you build revival in our hearts that regardless of what happens in November, after November, in any future election, God, would you build such a burning to see you move and you work in our lives and the lives of the people around us, God, that we would live in satisfaction and joy, knowing that you're in control, knowing that you will right every wrong, knowing that you sit on the throne and you rule and reign. God, give us that confidence to live that way. We ask God in your son's name, Jesus. Amen, amen. We live lives of radical submission through supernatural confidence, right? What a beautiful thing. And if you are here today, all of us on the entire planet, we are either slaves to sin, we are slaves and we are under submission of the kingdoms of this world, or you have been delivered and we are now slaves of the living God and, and, and of Christ himself. And we are part of an everlasting kingdom. And so if you know Christ, leave today with that supernatural confidence, knowing that you are are part of the kingdom of light and you have been delivered. If you've raised your hand for the first time, if you've come to know Christ today, please meet us outside. We'd love to have a conversation with you and welcome you to the family. Thank you. You're dismissed. Enjoy your Sunday.